Game number one, everybody. Heroes High Premier Series, and we are headed into the third place decider. Washed France going up against the Vikinger Fabriken, aka the Vikings. And well, we're gonna have a bit of a look at who's gonna take it today. I talked about both teams already quite a bit in the recent video. So if you are a little bit confused about the teams, again, teams changed not only in name but also in compositions after we had the last season of the Heroes High Premier Series conclude and Division S conclude as well. So there has been have been a couple of roster changes, team have given themselves new names. Obviously Washed France is pretty much still the setup with which we've seen another washed up washed up 2.0, however you want to call them, but the lineup that has played in the last Premier Series for Heroes Hype. There were a couple of changes, especially since Granite Gaming picked up Chris amongst others so there has been a bit of a roster shuffle but there's still familiar names that you see on all these sides and especially when you're looking over to the swedish team in red right now we have uh, schwimpy playing in here as you can see with the smurf account right now we have smexy even playing with the boys a bit so it's a pretty sweet setup um, overall and this could be a really cool series too it's a bit difficult to really predict who's going to be the favorite in this one since obviously both teams changed slightly now wash france with a ban on tracer and we also have well chen and rexa banned out so uh, that's heroes that especially has well when it comes to rexa this heroes that has has played a lot in the past for them but there's the mephisto ban since maka is obviously still fond of that guy so uh, let's see how this is gonna turn out I'm kind of excited for this. Again, we don't really know the power levels about the two teams at this point. We've seen them obviously play in the semi-finals. But that only gives you so much information. Because right now we are starting into uh, the second half of the year. And therefore a lot of these teams will just rise and fall in power level slightly. But wow, we have actually Vala taken immediately. Yeah, right away. Make again. Vala is super popular right now in Europe, and for good reason. I mean, she is doing exceptionally well in all the games where she gets played. If you can get her with double support, that's fantastic. If not, then a good Vala player will still be able to dish out a big beating there. Uh, well, on the blue side though, Malfurion starts us off into the series together with ETC. They've actually started to highlight ETC a bit more, which is always cool against Granite Gaming of course as well, since you take heroes away from them. It's not quite the same value that you get when you are going up against the Vikings here, but still, it's somewhere on that level. This is a best of three series by the way, so we're in the first of potential three maps that we're going to see here. And are we going to see that Tassadar pick? I would assume that if Tassadar doesn't get taken here, if they don't go for a double support setup, there's a good chance that Washed Fans are actually banning it out. And there we go! Schwimpy actually was the one to lock in Tassadar for now. And we have Backhult on Garrosh. Okay. At that point, I always ask myself a little bit, would it be valuable to actually get the speed bonus on level 4 for Tassadar? And the answer is usually no. That's mostly something that you see in uh, Storm League or Quick Match from people that have no idea what they're doing. Uh, especially with Vala, you can go either into armor or into the extra life leech, but very rarely does it make sense to give the speed advantage through Tassadar to the front line. We've seen that trick with Zarya on the other hand a lot, but I kind of doubt a bit that we're going to see it here. Then again, things change, so maybe there's a chance, but at this point I would say the chance is very, very slim. Either way, we're having currently uh, the ban on Toranda, so no additional stuns that are coming out from this one. And Li Ming gets picked off as well. So Mene can't actually play with Li Ming here. And yeah, I'm a little bit interested what Mena's going to play, because I would say that Kalthas is still something that he could pull off here. He loves to play his Kalthas, and Tomb of the Spider Queen is one of the few maps where he has shown the hero in the past. Now, Hazops. Are we going to see him on that bot lane again? Uh, I mean, actually, we'll Gul'dan this time. Okay, time for the fell. And all shall swiffer. Leoric is in. Uh, now that the bot lane got, oh sorry, the off laners got banned out this heavily. Makes a bit more sense. But yeah, good setup for now. Like, both of the teams are having a really solid and stable setup for the time being. But the question is, what's the, uh, um, the bot lane hero for the Vikings? That's my main question right now. We're still missing, of course, Maxi, but that could be Rhaegar for him. Just to name one hero that they could play. It's Uther instead, so we even see the Divine Shield. And we have Junkrat now, too. So Tassadar likely going to take over the bot lane at the beginning. Or Junkrat. Depends a little bit. Could play a bit of a different setup now, too. 
But Hazu still needs a hero, and we have the off lane, so he played a lot of Jim Rayner. We have seen a bit more Phoenix lately too, which is another hero that he could theoretically pick if you want to have an auto attacker with a setup. And this is going to conclude the draft for game number one then. And it's Thrall, they go triple frontline. They add Thrall for the mix, triple melee, Gul'dan the only range damage dealer. And with this ladies, we are actually heading straight into game number one of the best of three series here at the Heroes Hybrid Premier Series. Game on everybody! We have our first map in the best of three series. Over to the left side. Washed France with Hazoops on Thrall, Banana Age on Malfurion, Dequaza on Leoric, Main on Gul'dan, and Masquerade on ETC. To the right side of the map, the Vikings with Smexi on Uther, Mak on Vala, we have Schwimpy on Tassada, Gia on Junkrat, and Bakult on Garrosh. All right, let's get the action going here. This is going to be a really interesting game, especially since I want to see how much the double support Vala can pull off here. We've seen Maka already with the hero a few times, so rocking the cowgirl here with a cloud. And in this lineup, there's a very target-rich environment at the front since there's a double melee being used. So that should also lead us into Reign of Vengeance over Strafe this time, since there's plenty of interrupts available for the blue team as well. And that's yeah, going to be a fun one. I think Marcus should be able to get a lot of damage out there. For me personally, it's really coming down to Mene again. If he can, with a good Horrify after level 10, disrupt the flow of the double support, he might be able to allow them to get quick kills in against Vala. But right now, that setup with the double support might just be a little bit too much for Washed France to handle. But again, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. At this point, it's obviously just the early poke that we're seeing here. But the lineup that we have for the Vikings is a really solid one. I'm a little bit skeptical on that Uther still. It's mostly North America that is really massively on board with Uther. I like that he has the panic button where he can simply use the Divine Shield and keep Vala alive. But I honestly would have expected them to go maybe into Vega. There's a couple of other choices they could have made too. Uther surprised me slightly because Europe hasn't really been on the Uther train for a long, long time. But Uther has a couple of cool tools that he brings to the table. And uh, his stun, especially after Benediction on 16, is obviously a big one. So you have more of Lockdown. And if you're really just interested in the burst here, then he helps with that too. So he can allow Market to go a lot deeper with this entire action of course as well. We'll see how much that comes into play then. For now Hazops is actually the one that has to rush away here pretty quickly up towards the top and is already in slight trouble here. Hazo <laughs> gets no he doesn't get away. Utha yeah oh my god Smexy with the kill and that's the first blood against Thrall yeah hashtag not my war chief so he's already down. Shrimpy barely gets out as Masquerade was threatening him for a second. That's a great start for the red team. The Vikings doing well and working obviously on their first turn in now too. As Vala as expected heads into the build and here comes Kala's Embrace for the extra lifesteal through their plasma shield. Alright, so far so good. He attacks at the same time all the way up to the top as Dequaza is currently getting attacked here. And is able to move out without much trouble. But again, the early kill against them is a bit of a setback, but it's nothing really that's gonna have too much of an impact. We have now also Fahaz Ops outside of Echo of Elements, the Frost Wolf pack, so he's working on the mana management with the wolves and also, in addition to it, the cooldown reduction that could capitalize with Frost Wolf, oh, sorry, with the Alpha Wolf later on at level 16 if he goes down that path. But I think Thunderstorm might be the better choice for them, especially if they want to have the point and click damage against Vala. That's one of the best things that you can obviously pull off against a very nimble hero. It's one of the reasons why we oftentimes see that particular combo against Tracer, for example. But Vala is, in many ways, similar to that. All the other attackers in this case are. But the early game looks good for the Viking, uh, for the Vikings at this point. Uh, we have Smexy again taking the position there. There's a stun follow up possibly, but yet the power slide up. And instead, they're trying to turn it against Backholder with a slow from Leoric. They nearly got that kill in. Junkrat wasn't there though, and that means that an entire wave at the top got pushed out. And this one is pretty much a loss in experience now for the blue team. I mean, Leo comes in a bit late and is able to soak the remaining few minions, but they definitely lost a fair share. And that means that we have a decent lead already for the Vikings here when it comes to experience. So I gotta say, 
washed Franz in a bit of trouble at this point. So uh, we have now two steps on the Frost Wolf pack for Hazorps. So we need to be cautious with this too. He wants to keep those stacks alive. Uh, Backhold gets that shield quite a bit at the front. This is one of the reasons why, especially with uh, that setup, I could have totally seen them going to the armor on level 4 instead of the life leech. Only Bala will be able to capitalize on that, but if your goal is to keep the frontline alive because it's the only melee hero, then having that extra armor might just be enough to make it happen. As it stands though, we have with level 7 also the hand of freedom taken. Vala gets out! <laughs> was actually able to escape here. That was nearly the first kill for Wash France. Malfurion, by the way, is also a bit low on mana. He's now topping it off again as Backhold is just throwing Azorbs around. Interrupts, of course, are the priority at this point. And in this case, there's none against the Thrall. And that means that the Blue Web Weavers are going to descend first. So yeah, sweet setup for them. We're now having topside Dequaza sitting tight against the Gia. We're also seeing down at the bottom of the map again Masquerade with his little pressure play against Vala, trying to put her into a corner quite successfully at that. Has to hold back his power slide oftentimes since obviously Garrosh would be a huge problem. And that didn't really work out. So Maxi just ate a lot of damage and oh boy are they pushing this hard now. But the Web Weaver's already there. Nobody's dealing with the mid lane. They have actually moved down to the bottom of the map with nearly in the entire squad. Mid lane is getting massive value now and Washed Up is just playing their cards beautifully here. I mean, seriously, this is looking great for them. This is the first Web Weaver wave and they're getting mad value out of it. I mean, even the Web Weaver in the middle has now been able to take down the entire wall pretty much. And they're already rotating in, creating more space, especially through ETC's face melt. But the bottom fort has been eliminated, and at the top there's severe damage too. That's a great setup for them. I mean, honestly, this is really, really strong what they just showcased here. They might not have taken a massive lead in experience by this, but now the passive increase that they get is a strong one. And their uh, top side also broken through here. For first objective? That's pretty powerful. That's quite nice. And with this said, we're having Hazo again starting to also take down the camp together with Mena over to the right side of the map. We're currently seeing the same action happening from the Vikings. But yeah, so far so good. Level 10 is going to drop for both. There's obviously still the threat of another turn in from uh, Wash France. They're soon going to have enough gems to make it happen, now to be exact. But we still haven't seen the first turn in for the Vikings. Here's the attempt of Gia to turn in another 17. That would be enough to seal the deal. But there's the Entomb against Backhull. Can they get the kill? And the answer is no. Backhull moves out. That's one of the problems that you have when you are only rocking a single range damage dealer. But now that level 10 ability is in, we are seeing Schwimpy with a wall. Build that wall. And on top of that, we're also having the Divine Shield. And Horrify. I mean, this is going to be the big one. This is going to be the big, big, big jig choice here. And Schwimpy with solid force wall play would really ruin the day a little bit. I mean, just pressure, for example, the escape path like he does right now. And Masquerade gets out. Horrify has been used too to keep him alive here. I don't even know if it was necessarily needed, but it was definitely the safe choice for them. Another wall is already in play. Uh, Tassada drops walls faster than Donald Trump can write tweets. It's pretty amazing. I mean, it's a nice skill to have, especially after level 20, of course. And up at the top lane, the pressure against another one. I mean, so far, things are starting to equal out a little bit since the Vikings are taking down structures on the outer side as well. So there we go. That is actually a 4-4-4 pretty much. It's party time, baby! Oh yeah, Divine Shield keeps him alive for a short moment. Garrosh that is, and he is able to turn it around and punish E2C for that audacity. There's no time to party right here, baby. So instead, it's E2C that goes down, rip tire, and another four small. There we go. Nicely done. I gotta say, Schwimpy is really doing well with it. I mean, holy hell, that was pretty cool. So we have also the kill against uh, <laughs> against Gul'dan, and that's four kills against zero all of a sudden. So much for uh, that the power of that lineup. Double support Vala doing extremely well right now, and that was actually insane. That was really well coordinated from them. I, mean, I like it, especially you have to consider this is a newly formed team too. 
Now, granted, Washed Franz obviously is not quite the same lineup that we had for Washed Up in the past. That lineup has shifted significantly. But it's kind of cool to see that we're having a bit of a switch when it comes to the power levels for the teams. Since especially towards the end of the first season in 2019, we had uh, Washed Up pretty much dominate everything. But again, lineups change, and especially since Grand Gaming picked up Chris and Nick is now playing with Mopsio, it's a lot harder for Washed Up to rely on that strength that they had previously. Since obviously a lot of their communication has now been to has to be newly established too, which is not always easy. But the Swedes are killing it. Four kills against zero, and so far nicely done. I mean, right now we have the Web Weaver at the top, starting to pressure even more. That's the second Web Weaver wave for them. Down here is still a bit of a fight happening. Smexy is still sitting tight. Ooh, nearly the lockdown against Tassada. Hazu completes his quest finally, but gets locked down afterwards. And that's more gems lost now for Washed fans. They're losing ground. And they're losing it quickly. They are still in control of at least two forts, but the Web Weaver top side is doing solid work. And there's another kill! Garrosh creating the opportunity for the team here. And that's six kills against zero and level 13 talents. Top lane is absolutely opened up now. And it shouldn't take the keep down, but it will put them in a spot where at any point when the boss top side is taken, we're not only talking about keep, we could theoretically even talk about the core. So Smexy and his boys, not only with the lead in experience, but also a six kill lead. And looking very powerful now with that extra talent that they're currently running here. And Smexy's walls are absolutely amazing. I mean, seriously. Him together with Vakul, they created so many kill opportunities. And it's kind of terrifying too, if you think about it. I mean, you're getting thrown into the back line from Garrosh, then you have an immediate stun follow-up from uh, especially Uitha. And when you think you can finally escape, Tassada comes in and drops a force wall that is once again slowing you down as everybody else is just shelling away against you, Vala in particular. We're having her right now with Strafe, and there's the attack for the boss. 13 talents are there on both sides, but that boss gets murdered pretty quickly. Not everybody is there yet. A turn and attempt for Masquerade. Bit of a push through the middle with the camp. But the boss is going to be claimed. Boss is taken. Well, that should be the end of the keep at the top. If they push with it. If they don't push with it, then they can be defended against. But it's pretty much a trade at this point. So Web Weavers have just now been called down by Washed Friends. Which means that we're going to have a trade. The boss is not going to take the keep. But at the same time, the Web Weavers are also not going to do anything. They're going to be taken down here immediately. So, let's see what else we have. Um, down to the bottom, Gia is already defending. In the middle, it's pretty much the same thing now, too. And as mentioned, Keep is not going to fall. Or is it? Nah. Nah. It's going to be close, but not quite. Uh, Maka, again, dancing around here. Currently waiting for his level 16, so he gets a little bit more power. We've seen a lot of frost shots, but you could also play, of course, Manticore. And given that there's three melee heroes on the other side, Manticore would be a fantastic choice, especially if you expect level 20 to come in at some point. Yeah, again, the Entomb, but they don't have enough range damage. Here comes Thrall with the Earth, Quake as they're pushing in. And it could be a kill, but the Divine Shield comes out and saves Garrosh's ass. Garrosh alive, the Horrify not hitting the perfect angle. And the Hand of Freedom came out too. Gia's coming in from the side, drops the grenade and just takes down Malfurion. Yep, yeah, there comes Manticore. Another force wall attempt, throw to the front, trying to look for the stun, but ETC creating the space once more. And Tassada is just firing off one storm after another now that they have level 16 and he has the psionic echo for the double storm. In addition to that, we're also having Manticore, as mentioned, the Benediction is in play. For Garrosh, we see the defensive measures again and the mortal combo. So going straight into that Groundbreaker once more. The Groundbreaker variation of the build has taken on level 1, obviously, the Warbreaker with this one too. One stack away. For Gul'dan to complete also his Echo Corruption just before level 16, so that's going to help them a lot to get additional damage out. And we'll see how much they can do with this. But what else do we have there? The Quasar's already sitting tight, Masquerade, they're all waiting to see if they can maybe prevent that turn in and ideally get a kill, especially with uh, Leoric having the Entomb ready. That might just be enough. The idea for the blue team is to get level 16 now before they take a fight, but they want to delay the turn in. So far, there's not a lot of turns that are happening, but it's enough to get the next Web Weaver wave. There were only one single gem short. So now we're having with seven kills against zero, the Web Weavers pushing again. 
And we are already having the fort in the mid lane deleted. And as you can see, Junkrat moved straight into the top lane and said, all right, I'm going to take down that wave before the web weavers are even there. The fight is already starting up though. The small poke that is happening here. And top lane keep is in so much trouble. Top lane keep should actually be an automatic destruction. Uh-oh, uh-oh, Banana Age with another fantastic... Oh -ho -ho! And Jesus was definitely bribed hard by Vala. All of the shots with the arrows connecting against Malfurion and he actually falls with the last connect. Nicely done. But that force wall that allowed all of this to happen was absolutely fantastic. Fantastic job by Schwimpy once again. Well done here. And at this point, the keep at the top lane is in trouble. The one in the middle is obviously experiencing quite the beating too. And this is looking worse and worse and worse for washed France with every single second that passes here. Eight kills against zero pretty much tells you the tale. There's the Horrify though. The Mosh Pit comes in too. And they actually get the kill. They get the kill against Uthan, guys. The top keep and the middle keep both still stand. Backhult, oh, alive for now, gets pushed back in. And Backhult might die and should die. Yeah, it, no, you got, no way. Nine hit points. Oh, Tassada falls. But Backhult, he had nine hit points at one point. Hazo Ops gets the lockdown against Junkrat and they go for Marke now too. They might just get another kill here. Yep, indeed they do. Four kills out of nowhere pretty much. But just look at these structures. Both of them are so low. Washed France is able to hold on to all the keeps and they get four kills in total. <laughs> That's insane. That is honestly insane. Now, Mena has already started now at the bottom of the map to deal with the Siege Giants and go straight for them. But damn, that is unbelievable. There's still a lead for the Vikings in uh, the game here in experience. But yeah, that is just nuts. I mean, they could have taken two keeps with this if they just pushed a little bit harder. Honestly, if they would have known that they would lose half the heroes one could have stayed behind and just taken the keep down and traded in for the life but obviously they were trying to get away there but yeah what an insane setup game is obviously not over by any means but the situation for wash france is still a bit dire they get the turn in of course but the question is how much can they do with it if they can get a keep with it now that would be the dream that would be great that's a little bit unlikely well then again if they get another good setup they might actually be able to pull it off. They're focusing onto the bot lane where they have a catapult and siege giants push anyways. In terms of damage output, what else do we have with this? 45,000 for Gul'dan, but just look at Vala. 72,000. But she has to dish a lot of damage out since she is the main damage dealer. She's the only ranged damage dealer for them. Actually, it's not quite true. Obviously, you have Junk Red there as well who's sitting at 32,000. But his siege damage is obviously phenomenal. Despite the fact that they're also having Tassada in the game. Then you look over to Gul'dan and he's sitting at 236,000 siege damage and it's just insane. 20 now ready for both sides. And this is honestly where I start to become even more concerned for Washed Up or Washed Fans. Just simply because we have the Far Flight Quiver and Vala now with the Divine Shield as she's caught by the Entomb. Vala can now just wreck the melee heroes. Vala has Manticore on level, uh, on level 16. So now with this, she should be able to absolutely destroy the melee heroes here with her connects. And should get even more damage out. It's honestly scary. It's really, really, really scary what Vala can pull off with all of this. So uh, we'll see if they can keep them alive. I mean, Leo already died, but he's going to be back soon. Azob still making the connect. Vala actually rooted and gets taken down. Fantastic move for Masquerade. Coming in from the side just the way that he did sealed her fate. If not for that, they would have definitely kept her alive. But that was a great move. Masquerade himself needs still to be cautious though because as you can see, Smexy, um, sorry, Shrimpy is doing a great job just trying to lock them down as quickly as he can with a force barrier here. So insane cooldown reduction. I mean, he can pretty much spam this out with no cooldown whatsoever at this point. But it is a fantastic setup. And, well, all of the quest talents 
the exception for Junkrat's level 4, have now been claimed. With Vala down, there's obviously not enough damage to really contest the boss approach that we're seeing from Washed France. And this first game is already getting really nice. Look at Shrimpy, by the way, he's done with this shit. He wants to take it down, and he is going to get it. Yep, that keep is toast, and now he's going to retreat for the defense. And the boss is already up at the top, but the first keep just has fallen, and it's on the side of Washed France. Shrimpy is just saying, guys, I got enough. I can't watch this on the minimap any longer. I have to go in and make sure that they are actually that we actually at least get this one, so that we have a few catapults pushing through, or I'm going to buy it in, in I don't know, some meatballs or something. Uh, by the way, baguettes versus meatballs. Honestly, both of them as a combination would be pretty strong here. We have even a little bit of bratwurst in game as Hazorps is of course the last remaining German in the lineup. He's responsible for the efficiency and so far they're pretty efficient with the setup as they are taking a uh, keep now as well. Masquerade on the other hand has to even use the bolt of the storm on level 20 to get away from, uh, from Schwimpy. He thought he can get away from Schwimpy, but Schwimpy is just dropping one wall after another. <laughs> and here's the turnaround as Dayquaza says, I'm done with this shit, but it doesn't help him either. Reptire interrupts the mosh pit, but Backhold still falls. Horrify against Tacita, and that's the end of him, and Vala dies too. And all of a sudden, Washed France is on their way to the core. They can try and go for the game right here, right now. Five versus two in just a few seconds. Leo is still down, but he's going to be back soon. He's still going to go for the slows here for the drains. The shield has already fallen, and they make the play for Smexy at this point. Smexy gets attacked. Mena is just homing in on the core as we speak, and with 30 seconds until the heroes are back for the Vikings, there's just no chance for defense here. This is going to be win number one in this best of three series for Washed France. They take down Utha, and that is the end of game number one. Fantastic performance here from both teams, but Washed France takes the victory on Tomb of the Spider Queen. Game number two, everybody! Infernal Shrines is the map, and we have Washed France in the lead against the Vikings. It was actually a pretty good game from the Vikings on the last map. <laughs> Uh, still, the one attack where they got shut down and they nearly took two of the keeps was probably quite frustrating considering that Washed Up used that moment to start the entire comeback and take them down. But now the blue team has the lead in the series and as we are approaching Inferno Shrines, the big question is going to be if the Vikings can come back into that. It's going to become a little bit tricky though because Washed Up is a team that excels in the late game and on Inferno Shrines you can do a lot with a good late game composition. They played Tigers, I think, two times now on this map already, highlighting a little bit more how strong Odin can be if you're trying to get that shrine. Now, other regions, China in particular, but also to an extent North America, have used Alexstrasza more and more on this map for exactly that reason. In HTC times, there was even a strategy um, over in North America for a long time where uh, teams would go into Alexstrasza and Tigers and then just shift around the Dragon Queen and Odin in order to get the objective and win one shrine after another. But we're having now also Mephisto banned out against Maka, since this is normally the hero that he likes to play on this map, even though recently he hasn't really focused onto it as much anymore as he did in the past, but he still plays it. Chen, since he is super strong, is taken. The big part of Chen is really that once that he has the triple panda, once he uses his ult, he can easily jump into the back line and, especially with a bit of help from any other hero, annihilate a squishy. I mean, we've seen him chase down Malfurions, Tyrandas, like Hanzos. It doesn't really matter like, who is in the backline as a squishy hero. If Chen gets the ult through and someone else jumps in with it, it's pretty much a secured kill. Or it's very difficult to keep the target alive. So he can wreak havoc in big team fights in your backline, and that's one of the reasons why he gets actually banned out. We don't really see Kek play with him anymore, because Kek, honestly, it's a pretty shitty ult these days. Even after the attempted buffs that Blizzard has introduced, it just doesn't compare even to the pandas. So Vala gets banned out this time too. Vala obviously a really, really strong hero on this map as well, just simply because you gain stacks on the objective when you're going for that, and on top of that, you're also getting the hero damage out. It's actually cool that we're seeing Mena's hero banned because Every those horrifiers, as I mentioned in the draft of game number one, are still <laughs> incredibly strong. Hanzo at this point gets locked in pretty much instantly. And, well, 
with that, we're waiting for the picks for washed fans. As we're sitting in the draft, there's still something that I want to actually throw out there because the question pops up so often that I feel I have to answer it again, especially on YouTube. Sometimes people ask me, hey, why don't you include the drafts in your video? As you see, there's a draft right here. So pretty much the rule of thumb is every single time that you see a draft in a video on YouTube or here on the Twitch channel, the game has been commentated live. But as I obviously also cast games from North America occasionally, where there's a huge time difference, or sometimes I cast a couple of games afterwards when we couldn't cast them live because, let's say, the two semifinals are played at the same time and not consecutively, then I cast one of the games from replays, and unfortunately Blizzard doesn't include the draft in replays. So every single time that you don't see a draft analysis in one of those videos or on the live stream, you can assume that it's actually a replay cast that you're watching and that it's not necessarily a live game. The same happened today. Before we started into the semi-final, I actually, I'm oh, sorry, into the third place decider, I actually casted the semi-final from yesterday that I couldn't cast live because both of the semi-finals were played at the same time from replays to get things started here. So I hope that explains things a bit for everybody that was still on the fence on that. But as the draft continued, we have actually Leoric played super early together with Diablo, so the front line is already locked in for washed fans. And Leo is really good on the map because, well, in Tomb is fantastic. You get a lot of AoE damage on the Shrine, which is really nice for them. Backhold on his Tyrell, on the other hand, great hero if you're just trying to secure a position a bit longer. And having Sanctification on the Shrine is insane. And there's the Alexstrasza ban. So Alexstrasza actually gets banned out right now. Obviously, she can combo with Diablo quite a lot too. But one reason is just that Dragon Queen. And you want to make sure that your opponent doesn't have that. And they are a bit worried about this. Especially with that Tychus focus that we have seen from Hazu Ops for Washed France and Washed Up previously on this map. I think they played it now two, three times already. But with that said, Tyrande gets locked in again. And there is Jaina. So we have Diablo and Tyrande as a stun combination and then Jaina for the burst damage right after it. As we're heading into the second game. And uh, this is the third place decider. So there's obviously points on the on the line. There's prize money on the line too. There's points, but we're still in a qualifier where you can gather points for the big final uh, playoffs that we just had for the first season in uh, the Heroes High Premier Series. Final two picks for the Vikings, the Vikinga Fabriken, and it's Thrall and Tracer. All right, party time. Malfurion and Tracer, fantastic combo. The heal over time. And in addition to that, we're having also Tyrael with additional shields for her. And this is going to be a cool one. This is going to be a really nice one because obviously Tyrande is already on the menu. You can really go for Jaina if she doesn't have Ice Block yet. In the early game particularly. But with that said, what is Mena going to get here? Now that we have Jaina, I mean he could play that hero too. Or what are we having for him? It's hammer time! So Hazo most likely on Sergeant Hammer. And then... We're gonna have a Mena on Jaina, that's at least what we can expect here. Either way, no matter how they run it, we're heading into game number two, Infernal Shrines, Washed France against the Vikings. Game number two, everybody, and we have Hammer Time again. They gave the German uh, the tank, and when the Germans have their Panzers, then it becomes scary, and Hazops is no exception. So Washed France here. Straight with the German Panzer Brigade here. It's actually a little weird because it's playing with mainly French people And I don't really think they have the fondest memories of the German tanks But I mean either way whatever floats your boat Banana Age on Tyrande, Main on Jaina, De Quasa on Leoric and Masquerade on Diablo On the other side of the map the Vikings with Smexion Malfurion, Muck on Thrall, Schwippy on Tracer We have Backhold on Tyrael and Gia on Hanzo the interesting part with this is actually that Hammer is not only a hero that Hazobs loves to play on Infernal Shrines and Battlefield of Eternity, and with which they are extremely good, but at the same time, it's a fantastic hero against Tracer, of course. Since Tracer is very, very, like... The problem with Tracer is that her mobility makes it oftentimes difficult to land skill shots against her. This is why auto attacks or point and click damage is really, really good against Tracer. Oftentimes you see, for example, Thrall again picked her so that you can use the Chain Lightning. Or you have, let's say, I don't know, Reyna on the other side. But especially when we're talking about Sergeant Hammer, the auto attacks, they really hurt. I mean, it's really packing a punch. So if Tracer is finding herself in range, then Hammer can absolutely demolish her. And that comes on top of Sergeant Hammer's ability to really just control a position on a shrine or anywhere else. 
So this is going to be a pretty, pretty difficult setup for Schwimpy in certain situations. I mean, again, you can still get a lot of kills with this. Tracer obviously is a hero that relies really on the swiftness and the dashes into the back line and then with a quick kill and a recall out you try to get an advantage there. It's not really a composition that is necessarily designed to absolutely out, uh, yeah, out a AOE the opponent's team. If you're going up against Leo with a skeleton swing and then also Jane on top of that, that's difficult enough as it is. Yeah, down here, look at Shrimpy. Shrimpy is already in trouble thanks to all the auto attacks. Even with the shield that we saw from Teriel, no kill against Hazo and the cam has been taken. Yeah, Tracer goes down as Mena comes in from the side and gets the kill in. Alright, that helped. And that's obviously setting uh, the game up pretty nicely for Washed Friends. And they have a really well-rounded comp for this map. Not only do they have a lot of control over the shrines with Sergeant Hammer, with also Diablo, who can pretty much, after level 16, one-shot Tracer, Malfurion, or even Hanzo, if he gets the reset with Dominance on 16. But in addition to that, we're just having them with more wave clear than their opponent, and the Vikings, they rely on kills. They really do. I mean, Hanzo is fantastic on the map, obviously, in pretty much in every setup, especially with the stun setup that he has. But they need their kills here, and that's what they are going to waiting, be waiting for. Masquerade with the aggression, again, has a bit of a lockdown with the root as Malfurion is laying down the lawn. And the quest completed for Thrall as he gets his Echo of Elements stacked 2 minutes and 30 seconds into the game. But I'm a bit scared for the Vikings. That's going to be a tough composition to break through when you are on the shrine and sitting in a 5 versus 5 setup. Also, we're having, for now, the target practice taken on level 1, and in addition to that, the explosive arrows. So, uh, a bit of a different build for Hans. I'm not specking into uh, scatter shots or anything like that. But there's the setup, and this is exactly where we have now to watch out for the strategy of the Vikings if they're able to get their kills and when they really need them, because right now, Hazel is securing a good position for the team, is setting himself up with Sergeant Hammer, and this is obviously before hovering Siege Mode. Once he has that, things are even easier for him and much more comfortable. So he wants to get the next level, he wants to get the next talent, and he should get it also quite quickly and a lot faster than uh, the Vikings. So a really good setup for the first objective here. Yeah, wall stun is in, follow up is there, good combo, back hold alive. Long enough gets out, but with the tank already that demolished, they can't really fight for this position any longer. Still much better wave clear from the Vikings as expected, and they held their own for a long time on the shrine, but now they're falling behind significantly, and there it is. The oh oh, maybe the kill against Dibbles? Ah, yes, we do have that. But two against the red team, as we see, not only Thrall, but also Tyrael fall. Uh, then again, <laughs> Tyrande has also drop in drop. Arcane Punisher is in. <laughs> And Tracer gets wrecked again! Mene for the second time, just absolutely annihilating her. But Sergeant Hammer falls right after that. It's a total slugfest here. I mean, it's just kill after kill after kill after kill. And the Punisher is sitting at the bottom of the map and is like, Team? Team? Really? Nobody cares about me? Nobody gives a shit what's going on here? There's nobody defending. Finally, we have Bakul there. But the wall has already been taken, and now they're going straight in for everything else. Yeah, it's actually kind of insane. So, Banana Age and Mena sitting in the mid lane here. Masquerade pausing the game for just a moment, has to set himself up properly. He has to talk to the rest of the, of the gang here. That fort, by the way, is not completely going to go down. Even with that arcane sentry, it should actually survive here if they're taking down the minions quickly. But when we're looking towards the top lane, I mean, Dequaza has so far with Leo actually had quite the impact in the last game. If he can get to 20 and hit a couple of good buried lives against Tracer in particular, but also against Tyrell, for example, they're going to look really strong here. Now, the big problem, as we said before, is that this... Despite the fact that this last little engage here resulted in 8 kills in total, I think not quite, I think it was 7, 1 before that, but Hammer has now finally her level 7. So the Hover Siege mode is in, and that allows Hazo Ops to be a lot more annoying as he slowly moves in and out of the fights. Now, the aggression that we've seen from uh, the red team is going to continue the way that they just did. And they got a lot of kills. And obviously, as Shrimpy on Tracer is going to head into the late game, he's becoming more dangerous too. 
and when level 10 abilities are in, there's a lot of possible engages that they can set up, and sanctification becomes a matter as well. But right now, it's still a good start for Washed France. They just need to make sure that once that level 10 abilities are in, they still keep that coordination up. Because the Vikings, despite the fact that they lost the last fight, did in a lot of regards a lot better than probably expected. Especially their wave clear is not looking as... Uh, lacking as it seemed. So they are currently setting this up at the bot lane, but of course the fort is so low that just one or two shots from Hazoff is going to eliminate it. So this one's down. It's a slight lane advantage that we're now having from them. But let's see what else is going to happen with this. Top lane, Marke still sitting at the poke, has by now also the Ancestral Wrath. Still the best talent for Thrall on level 7 for the hero. Good stain and also a quick burst that we can push through with it. Take Quasar. Ah, missing the drain. But he has now the level 10 abilities and this is where the Ring of Frost of Mane comes in again. Yeah, the stun didn't really work out here. Banana Age, Masquerade, coordinate that better against Shrimpy. That could be another kill against Tracer. As it stands, that wasn't the case. But just look at this lineup. You get one in Tomb through and you follow that up with Apocalypse, Ring of Frost or with the BFG. I mean, you can get insta-kills now from them. It is crazy. It's absolutely crazy what kind of a setup they currently have here with heroics. And it's very, very scary. The meme strike for Hanzo. Uh, so once the Entomb drops, you can actually drop the meme strike right there and try to zone the opponent out a little bit with it. Not necessarily the worst thing. Problem is you don't have anything where you can follow up on the stun anyways. So maybe that zone control might give you something if your opponent tries to make a play just to interrupt the loan. It'd be worth it for you. Five kills against three still. And we're all waiting for the next objective, which is this time going to spawn bot side, uh, top side, as both of the teams are now waiting for their shaman camp to be taken too. So at the top of the map, there's the hovering siege mode, and it's finding value. Down goes the first turret, and the push back against Marker. Not really playing around this just yet. The rest of the team is also guarding the flank, so nobody can uh, flank in on Hammer and try and take her down. Uh, Hazops is still sitting tight there, down at the bottom of the map. Schwimpy is trying to get some extra experience. Mena is just waiting behind the gate, has no interest of actually fighting it out with Tracer. Instead, is just going to drop the AoE here gets the experience and is then going to move towards the top side. So yeah, easy one for him. This then again is Shrimpy's little plan. He wants to uh, get the, 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 the rotation. Up at the top, nearly a kill. Shrimpy still sitting there. Mena playing it very, very safe. And Shrimpy has to back out. Now, if Mena would have taken a different path and not straight into the fort, he would have died there. I mean, again, this seems like such a small thing, but this is actually what makes a very experienced player. That Mena did not take any of the direct paths towards the top and just went all the way around it through the fort. If he would have made any other choice, he would have died there. This was the only way where he wouldn't fall. That was unfortunate. The engage from Masquerade and the Entomb pushing Thrall out, then they're connecting with a flip over and the Entomb is worthless. But they have level 13. Level 13 is now ready. And they have again a big lead on the stacks. 17 against uh, 15. Actually, we're seeing the Vikings starting to claim a few as well. Still the advantage for the opponent's team, though. Hazobs with the hits, one after another. Mark is coming in deep. They're starting to create some space here. They're pushing them out. They're doing well with this. They're doing really well with this, despite the fact that they are talent down. But they are so far really holding their own. In comes the stun. Meme Strike is through. Mane eating a lot of damage from it. And Leo is already eliminated. Banana H is also falling and here's at least the ring of frost and the counter kill against Hanzo they get the second one against Tyrael too 33 stacks against 30 tranquility is still in main is low and it's gonna be a race Hanzo ops with the hits one after another 36 35 37 and it's the red team that takes it Mane couldn't go deep enough had to be careful against shrimpy he just doesn't have the ice block yet so we actually have the Vikings claiming objective number two in the game. Nicely done here. Really well done. Yeah, Masquerade now is also starting to bait over the, well, the Punisher. They're burning it down super easily. I mean, there's not really a whole lot of damage against structures that we're seeing from the opponent. Is there going to be in Tomb? Yes, there is an in Tomb. Stun into the wall. Flip over. But yeah, there's just not enough damage for them to really do something here. 
But at least there's not a lot that has fallen. I mean, you just look at that setup and what did they actually accomplish? They took the wall and that's that. Mena was sitting down at the bottom of the map the entire time, seeing if he can maybe get a kill here. Now in an ideal world, he is going to make sure that once he has the ice block, he's being a bit more aggressive. His problem was simply he can't go up against Tracer without having an ice block there. That's just not going to work for him. That's going to be a real problem. Sergeant Hammer, on the other hand, gets taken down at the top side. Schwimpy again with the play. Ah, Tracer making the moves at this point. Also, when we look at the damage, let's have a bit of a look what's going on there. Currently, Tracer sitting at 19,000. Having Hanzo at 25k. Hammer obviously <laughs> taking the numbers. I mean, 42,000 for the Sergeant right now. And this is game two. Again, the winner of this series will be third place in the tournament, in this qualifier. And, well... We might go the full distance. We might go into the third game. If the Vikings can take a victory on Inferno Shrines. And they're gaining a bit more momentum now. It's still fairly even in kills, by the way. Seven kills against six. Super close here. But 16 talents are now coming. And this is the problem for Schwimpy in particular, but for others as well. Because Masquerade is going to have his one-shot potential once he uh, gets 16. And that's really the scary part. Once that he has the reset on the cooldown and can use the double shadow charge and the wall stuns, then you can get insta kills if you set both of the stuns up into walls. So that's going to be a really, really good one. I mean, at this point, let's have another quick look here. Schwimpy and his boys are pushing through the middle. Gia, Smexy already sitting there. Maka as well. Leo comes in from the top, though. If he gets the Entomb, yeah, gets found out, doesn't use the Entomb yet, Dibbles comes in and they're trying to get the stun set up. Already the damage from Mainer, but they have to retreat, especially Diablo's in a bit of trouble. Here comes the meme strike, BFG, and the kill against Diablo. Nicely done as the second target dies as well. Down goes Leoric, and especially Schwimpy is now really starting to come in his own on Tracer. He set the kills up for Hanzo here, and got the bomb through. And that did a lot of damage. Sanctification didn't even have to be used. And now that both teams have level 16, it's actually the Vikings who are really starting to set themselves ahead here. They've taken the lead in experience, they've taken the lead in kills, and now they're starting to take in a bit of map control as well. Mainly through camps though. They haven't taken down any structures yet. And let's not forget that with Leo coming back in another three seconds, we are going to have an even fight over the next objective. So this is still a little bit of a make or break objective that is coming up next. Yeah, already sitting in the mid lane here, Masquerade. Trying to do his thing down at the bottom of the map. De Quasa is starting to move in to just annihilate another wave before he joins the fun. Pushes the lane out more heavily and is eventually going to attack the keep as well. Because obviously with every third wave there's a catapult spawning now. Since the fort has been eliminated. And here's the setup over the shrine. Both teams are going for it with level 16 talents in. And we're waiting for that combo, especially, of course, from Washed France. They have the Apocalypse, they have the Ring of Frost, and they're just waiting for that setup. Mena has so far not died. Him and Malfurion, the only two that haven't fallen yet in this game. They quasi waiting for the Entomb opportunity. Schwimpy sitting at the side there now, too. And they gotta be careful. 23 against 8. The Apoch setup is there. And the insta kill against Tyrael. No chance for him. Meme Strike is in. And Dibbles is alive. Oh my god. Tyrande making it possible. And his build, of course, chipping in for it too. But there's still 29 stacks for the Vikings. And they still want the objective. But here comes the next setup. Diablo sacrifices himself. Ring of Frost insta kill against Hanzo. They get Malfurion too. Two are down. 30 two stacks against 20. Maka is still sitting tight here. We're having Mena waiting at the side if someone is dumb enough to walk through the bush. But so far that's not happening. He wants the insta kill against Tracer. He's not going to be able to get that and the objective is going to be claimed by Washed France. Nice kill here with the Ring of Frost in particular. Especially as Leo came in with a swing to the face and take them down. So that was a big one. But yeah, this is actually getting now really, really dangerous for the Vikings. I gotta say though, I'm pretty impressed by the way that Hansa is using the meme strike here. I've been talking about it a bit earlier against any kind of combo that comes from Washed France when they use that at the appropriate moment in time that they can force the opponent to back off. But the ways that he's been using it were great. There is not a lot of combo potential 
with the usual arrow. So it kind of, I don't want to say it makes sense to go into Meme Strike here, but it is definitely a big option and he got a lot of value out of it. I mean, Hanzo has really done solid work and is sitting out 46,000 damage. That's definitely not enough to contest Sergeant Hammer in the damage department, but let's be honest here for a second, who can? If you have a good Hammer player, even just a hard, like, even, even just a decent one, you are going to end up in a scenario where Hammer has probably the top damage in the game here. So well, with this, camps are now getting attacked and level 20 is the next point on the agenda for the teams here. And with the control that we're now seeing on the camps, it's likely that Washed France is going to get that. So, yep, down to the bottom. We're now having the attack against the next camp already aimed at. And then with level 20, the only question is, can you force a fight? Yeah, talking forcing fights. There's one that's already getting forced. 20 is there. Schwimpy has the problem that if he goes too deep, he is going to be hit by the buried alive and not going to get out of there. But this is where they try to capitalize on the Storm Talons. They're pushing through the bot lane as much as they can. And, well, there we have it. Going for the wall with Storm Talons. Leo coming in too. And they should be, honestly, if they push it in, they might be just able to get the keep. Ah, uh, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> Again, you are you always a little bit scary to go up against the level 20 on your opponent's side. This is a freebie for them, but if they would stay longer, then it's uh, it's a problem. So for now, they're just like sitting tight. They know that it comes down to an even talent fight here, so they're not going too hard with it. But yeah, they need to be a little bit cautious with this for sure. Okay, so for now, we have on both sides storm talents get stuffed. That's all a bit taken by Tracer. And now we're also seeing uh, the Dragon Awakens, and that one is big. Getting the cooldown reduction now with the way that it has been used the entire time from them, from Gia, that is actually pretty big. Having a good setup there with massive cooldown reduction on these long and drawn out fights is absolutely fantastic for them. So we'll see how much Hanzo is going to get out of this. Mena, by the way, also with cooldown reduction, he went into Cold Snap on level 20. We see this a lot more, and obviously by now he also has his Ice Block, as we've already seen previously. So he has all the tools in his arsenal now. And it's an insane arsenal that they have here. I mean, again, Buried Alive is a game changer. Then on top of that you have Cold Snap, and Mena has already several games where he just gets a good Cold Snap through, gets the cooldown reduction through the talent, and then all of a sudden drops a second Ring of Frost in the fight. So yeah, that is pretty insane. But there's a lot more to be talking about as well. Earthen Shield's also true, but this is a scary fight now for both of them. But the position from Sergeant Hammer, and again, we have the Ultra Capacitators now too. Yeah, it's a scary position for uh, Vikings to be in because down at the bottom of the map, the fort is gone and the wall at the keep is also eliminated. So if Wash fans gets this one, there's a chance that they are going to take the entire thing. Here we go again. Apoch setup. Not quite successful, but the Ring of Frost connects, and here comes the kill. Yep, there's at least the Dragon Strike value, but next kill against Marker. Maybe not quite, but here comes Leo. Swiffer to the face and has to move out, but they get the initial kill against Malfurion. Oh my god, look how low they are. Masquerade tries to go in, and they actually get Tyriel. Hazorbs is still shelling away. There's the cooldown reduction, and they get at least the kill against Diablo. They look for Mena. Mena is chasing them down now 1v3 pretty much but Leo comes in pretty amazing ice block here that one was perfect but still the kill thrall down so is Jaina Hazops is already starting to focus onto the shrine what a setup and a double cutter pulled is already dealing with the keep and again this is the lane that the Punisher is going to move through to so it's a really bad spot for the red team to be in up at the top side Diablo can now try and get himself a couple of stacks since he obviously died in the last fight and was reset on the baseline. So he's going to get a lot out of this one. And with 31 now on the side of Washed France, stacks that is on the shrine itself, they're going to also claim the next objective here. What a setup once again. Main <laughs> actually just going in. But I gotta say, I'm amazed by the Hansa value in this game. 59,000 damage now against the 78,000 that we have for Hammer. Uh, Mena sitting on 37k. Dibbles by now, having a few additional stacks as well, which means that we're currently seeing him at 8. <laughs> Honestly expected him with a little bit more. If they can buy some time for him, that would be great. But yeah, they're holding back the shrine, they're waiting for Mena to come back so that they're not losing anything here. The Quasa sitting at the side, one single swipe would make sure that they get the objective, but they want to buy themselves a bit of time there. 
And just to set this up again, this one is pretty much non-existent anymore. And here's the kill attempt into the baseline, uh, into the backline. They're already pinging around here. And yeah, these are the moments when you try and get the kill. In comes, yeah, Shrimpy. Mena sees him, moves back immediately. Here comes the Dragon Arrow. The kill against Saranda, instantaneous. And they actually are able... Oh, back... Oh, ho, 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 back hold down. And Thrall is dead as well. The counter kill attempt against Leoric as he's ghosting in once more. But with now a one for two trade in the kill department, this is starting to look dicey again. Yes, it's the support that has fallen on the side of Washed France, but they should have to sustain with the Punisher to go for the core regardless. There it is already. Mena is moving in. A nice attempt by the Vikings, but this is looking really difficult now. They're baiting the Punisher over. Smexy falls though. The Quasar is low, but the shield is also falling and Hazops is still alive and he is just shelling the shit out of Shrimpy whenever he moves in and that is the end of Tracer but it's also the end of Jaina but with Hazorps on the tank there's just no other way this game is over this series is over Washed Fans is going to take the third place in this Heroes High Premier Series fantastic series by them well played and they take a 2-0 victory over the Vikinger Fabriken in this tournament nicely done and well played Hey guys, thanks for watching today's video and I hope that you enjoyed the match and the commentary. The remaining time of the video has been added to protect against spoilers caused by the length of the video itself. But please keep in mind though that this does not only mean more work for me but also has a negative impact on the popularity of the videos and the channel because of YouTube's algorithms. It would be greatly appreciated if you'd consider supporting the channel and help me to continue the daily esports coverage by clicking the join button below the video or supporting me through the Proterium page linked in the video description. Thanks a lot for the support and see you guys next time.